everyone welcome back to installation 00 and episode 4 of the halo tv series has dropped and again i've been through the episode from start to finish and noted down points of note that are interesting or i can otherwise extrapolate additional information on so let's kick this off straight away cortana confirms that what we see in slip space is actually the quantum stabilized field oscillating and giving off radiation she references the term Mobius, which is in respect to the Mobius Strip, basically a strip that can cycle back to its original point of origin. Chief also has a retroactive nod to Quan's earlier statement. Exit and mass shadowed space You're time. ruining it. Multiple threads to the same destination. You're ruining it. The exit from slip space shows both the Cherenkov radiation and the quantum field collapsing. It's a very nice touch. Now, Cherenkov radiation is basically where particles move faster than the speed of light within that respective medium. This happens very often in nuclear reactors when the reactor core is actually activated and the neutrinos from the nuclear reaction can travel through the water at faster than the speed of light can move through the water. It's not that they're defying the speed of light, the ultimate speed limit to the universe. It's simply that the neutrinos are moving through the water faster than light is able to move through the water and the consequence is a blue glow from the reactor core. This is mirrored in the slip space transition in that slip space is allowing something to move from one point in space to another point in space faster than the light would be able to travel the normal direction simply because that object is transitioning to that location via a higher dimensional plane or slip space. This is what's often referred to as slip space translocation. The consequence being that then photons of light and energy that are emitted from the slip space portal back into normal space are by definition travelling faster than light can travel in a vacuum, but almost instantly decelerate to the speed limit of the normal dimensions of space-time as opposed to the hyper-dimensions of slip space. This gives off this characteristic blue glow, the Cherenkov radiation. This has been referenced in both the books. Uh, I think it's been visually referenced in the games and is now being referenced here in the TV series and we can also see as I said before the quantum stabilized field that protects the ship in a bubble of normal space time while it transitions through slip space collapsing immediately upon rejoining normal space. It's just a small detail but really nice to see. I'm also noticing that generally speaking in these points of note so far I'm not really referencing much of Quan's story mainly because I think it's the human element story uh, with currently very little bearing directly on the lore. It's it's the personal, the, the, the journey and, and human-centric story that's being pushed as a means of, of continuing to develop the narrative. However, there is a little reveal at the end of this episode which suggests that perhaps I'll need to look into Quan's story going forward. This scene is chased by Kai removing her hormone regulation chip in the same way that Chief did. She already personally witnessed Chief remove his own, and has given Chief more than one sideways glance in reference to unusual developments of his character personality and the storyline. And as such, I'm extraordinarily interested to see how her particular story continues to develop. I did have a mad theory from very early on in the TV series where the idea was basically that Silver Team were in fact Blue Team, but because their memories had been suppressed, at least that's what the suggestion was that we were getting from the early narrative, uh, they didn't know that they were members of Blue Team, but that gradually their personalities would come out. That's, I think, already probably been debunked. But um, there's some interesting nods nevertheless in reference to Blue Team in this episode. Also, these coats, yeah, they're gorgeous. I need it. This is very much my style. So Paramount, 343 Industries, if you're watching, hook me up. Nah, seriously though, the, the costume design here is just fantastic. I'm loving it. Onwards from this, the world building within the markets has really brought human colonies and human controlled space to life in a way that it hasn't before. You suddenly realise this is likely happening across most of the outer colonies. It's just great to see that life is being breathed into every corner of UNSC space. Just seeing people going about their lives, trading, selling, buying, existing together in especially these tight, narrow corridors of a market. I don't know, it just it feels like it adds a, a degree of legitimacy to the world. It, it actually fleshes out the world behind the scenes, so to speak, and makes it feel more alive. 
The next scene finds Kai tending to her sniper rifle and then actually using effectively what I think is grease to dye her hair red. Now, I think this is probably a nod to Linda. One, well, Linda is the sniper of Blue Team and Kai is sat there maintaining her sniper rifle. And two, Linda was known for her naturally red hair. And Kai giving her blonde hair red highlights, I, I think, I feel like it's kind of a nod towards Linda, but there's probably a little bit more to it than just that, and it relates back to her removal of her hormone regulator chip. Again, we circle back to Halsey, and she's very obviously displaying discomfort at Chief's autonomy, but basically his desire to do what he wants, when he wants, whether she likes it or not. You can tell by the looks that she's giving her simping little assistant that, yeah, she's not happy with what's going on. We also see Kai have something of a passive confrontation with Miranda, and along with Chief somewhat defying Halsey's word and kind of doing what he wants when he wants, this is an attitude and confidence that we're gradually seeing from both Chief and Kai, probably directly as a result of them removing their hormone regulator chip and now being able to feel things and give an emotional context to what's happening around them. And that's exactly what Spartans are all about. They have a natural confidence and a natural attitude to the way in which they approach things. And seeing this boil closer to the surface and actually seeing them become Spartans effectively is pleasant to see in juxtaposition to the other two Spartans who still haven't removed their hormone regulator chips and to the behaviours of both Chief and Kai earlier in the season. Going back to Halsey, she evidently makes as many attempts as possible to keep Chief away from certain parts of his home, his childhood home, which may bring up memories that she doesn't want him to experience. She attempts on numerous occasions to redirect his attention, all of which fail, and she displays extremely obvious discomfort at the possibility that Chief could encounter a memory, a trauma, of exactly what happened in those earliest moments of his indoctrination into the Spartan program and then turn his attentions, his negative attitudes and his anger towards Halsey because even in this circumstance she has basically nothing on her side to control him. In the books there was a loyalty between the Spartans and Dr. Halsey because Halsey was always honest with them, she was always truthful and upfront. Even when they were first kidnapped for the Spartan program they were told the truth, they were told that they were called upon to serve, that they wouldn't see their families again, but that they were special and they were going to become Spartans and they were going to become humanity's greatest warriors. She was honest with them from day one and most of them, the vast majority of them, accepted that. They accepted their charge and because she was honest, it paved the way for trust, even with the indoctrination involved and even with the fact that you know you are still effectively... <laughs> indoctrinating and conscripting children after being kidnapped from their families into military service, there was still a rapport, there was still a trust between the Spartans and Dr. Halsey. That is not in existence here. If anything, the more that Chief finds out about how he was lied to and what he was lied to about and Halsey's manipulations for her own gain, the less he's going to trust her. And ultimately, that will backfire and blow up in her face. Next we see Cortana create an augmented reality overlay that is very much a lore mechanic. Various visor systems in Halo 4 and Halo 5 have been said to contain some degree of overlay information and AR generated perception mediating effects, including adding context to the surroundings as well as omitting certain things to keep the Spartan more focused on the task at hand. This was, at least initially, one of my prevalent theories behind why Chief kept removing his helmet in the early episodes due to his defiance of his orders and his distrust of the protocols that he was being given by the UNSC in that his visor systems could very well be affecting his perceptions of what's going on around him and as such he couldn't trust that his helmet wasn't being controlled by the Office of Naval Intelligence or the UNSC via an uplink and his perceptions were purposely being twisted. So to avoid that, he decided not to rely on his equipment and rely upon his senses, which is actually something taken directly from the books. Chief has always been of the inclination 
to not rely upon his equipment. Because equipment can break, equipment can fail, equipment can become faulty and malfunction, but senses cannot. I mean, to strictly speaking, they can be quite easily misconstrued. Anybody who's ever looked at a book of optical illusions is clear on the idea that your senses can be manipulated and... No, I, I'm getting sidelined. You, you get what I'm saying. There's a very brief moment as well where we hear the young John say something about smelling of soap. This, again, is actually in reference to one of the books and his early memories of his mother in remembering that she smelt like soap. In this AR-generated sequence as well, we get some fantastic moments of an internal shot of Chief's visor looking at Chief's face, very similar to uh, the way in which they executed the Iron Man uh, internal helmet views uh, for uh, Tony Stark, Robert Downey Jr. It's a fantastic way to have quiet moments with the Chief, and obviously you can see the HUD overlay, but you know it's it's minimalist and it's kind of out of the way. But the fact that it gives you that up close personal moment with the Chief while he's going through something that's evidently heavily emotionally linked is a fantastic way to get across the humanity of the situation. And I know that people don't necessarily like how often Chief is taking off his helmet, but seeing shots like this, where by definition he is wearing his helmet, but we're still getting those up close personal facial expressions coming from the Chief in regards to something that's evidently taking a toll on him is a fantastic storytelling element that cannot be understated or taken for granted. There's no two ways about it. Pablo is exceptionally good at micro expressions and getting across the movement that John is feeling internally through very subtle facial expressions, very subtle changes in uh, his eyes, a slight narrowing of the eyes, slight twitches in his cheeks, things like that. It's a fantastic e expression of the, of the stoicism of the Master Chief uh, while still having that that facial expression aspect available to us particularly in these moments it's made abundantly clear that cortana is no longer projecting an ar environment and that what chief is seeing is actually him visualizing what's going on in fact later on cortana analyzes chief's brain activity during this sequence and what is effectively happening is that he's having emotionally motivated memories boiled to the surface with direct involvement from his amygdala. By definition, he's actually technically somewhere between awake and in a dreamlike state. He's got an altered state of consciousness in this, in this instance where he's overlaying deep repressed memories from his subconscious over reality, which is what we're seeing. And yes to a, to agree to a degree that would be alarming for dr halsey but it also might speak to another quote unquote gift that the chief has that this that perhaps all of the spartans have due to some of their augmentations due to their uh, their neural implants and the like it it could be that they they can they have a heightened state of of conscious awareness and and cerebral activity that allows them to have these kind of moments. And this sort of thing is hinted to in a very different manner directly in the games in that the domain can interface directly to Chief's subconscious as we see happen in the early levels of Halo 5. Now, again, I'm trying not to draw too much of a connection between the games, the books, etc, etc, and the Silver Timeline because there is very clear differences and departures from the original law but that doesn't mean that there's no influence whatsoever and that could be an aspect of influence of some subconscious connection to something um, more ethereal within the halo universe within the silver timeline which chief may have access to particularly if these relics or these foreign artifacts have any connection whatsoever to the domain he touched one when he was a child so it's entirely possible that if they do have a connection to the domain and these are something of conduits to the domain, 
Chief's memories from when he was a child may have been directly uploaded to the domain through the Foreigner Relic. And then when he touched the Foreigner Keystone, the Foreigner Relic that he found on Madrigal, it reopened his connection to the domain. And what he's actually being fed at the moment is actually memories, his own memories being fed to him from the domain in his waking moments, hence the activation of his amygdala. It's a theory, I don't know if it's accurate, because we haven't actually particularly seen whether or not these these foreigner artifacts have a link to the domain. We're not even entirely sure if the domain technically exists in the Silver Timeline, but if it does, what's your opinion? Is Could this potentially be what's happening? I'd love to hear your comments. And this sequence of visions ends in his first encounter with Dr. Halsey within his own home. This unsettles Chief dramatically. You can see when he takes off his helmet, he doesn't quite know how to respond to the information that he's just been given and needs time to process it. But you can tell he is visibly confused and probably angry. Circling back to Kai, and we can see her curiosity is surfacing, and with it her personality is deepening, and her confidence and realisation of her own utility is becoming more acute. And particularly this is being noticed by Miranda, in that her speech, her knowledge of certain Sangheili words, is allowing her to add context to her research in regards to unlocking the Covenant language. It's also nice to see a little bit of dry humour between the Spartans, and the empathy from Kai towards Miranda is interesting to see so soon after her implant removal. Also, while I appreciate the hard lesson behind the pet story, it inevitably just adds to the hatred of the Halsey character. Everyone knows if you kill a child or an animal, you're basically the villain. The Halsey from the books made the choices she did for the greater good. It was terrible, yes, but it was done so with the intention of saving humanity. This Halsey seems to make choices to purposely control and influence the Spartans and those around her. It's a masterful manipulation for her own self-interests. So I think we're very much driving at the idea that this Halsey is the villain. No two ways about it. It's also massively rewarding to see small human moments between Kai and Miranda, particularly in reference to Kai's hair colour and the spur of the moment decision that she made in order to do so. And just that human moment of talking about it, just it's nice to see a Spartan interacting with other members of non-Spartan origin. Also, I duly note the Halo theme, the classic Halo theme, just pops through when they actually name the Halo, when they decode some of the Covenant speech and uncover the term Sacred Rings in reference to the Halo. The little secrecy between Kai and Miranda again seems to enforce this rebellion against Halsey, considering that Miranda is Halsey's biological daughter, and yet they basically have no cross-interaction whatsoever, even though they work in very close proximity to each other in the Silver Timeline. This wasn't the case in the mainline lore. Miranda was a UNSC captain and commander, and as such was serving in active duty during the Covenant War while Halsey was a civilian contractor doing her research for the Spartan programs. So they didn't really have much of an overlap, and yet in the Silver Timeline, they basically work in the same division, and yet they, that so far there's been no interaction between them. In fact, there's barely been eye contact between them. That's not normal for a mother and daughter at all. But then it was quite clearly established even in the games that Miranda resented Halsey because of her apathy towards her as her daughter. So this is evidently extended not just in regards to the apathy from an emotional level, but also the apathy from a professional level. Again, in the books, Halsey quietly expressed regret about this particular point so far. We haven't seen so much as a glimmer of concern in regards to the failed relationship between her and Miranda. There's been more of an interaction between Keys and Halsey than between Miranda and Halsey. The final monologue basically seems to round up the problems with Halsey's character from Miranda's own perspective. And it seems to ring true for the way in which she approaches the Spartans as well. And that final zoom onto the AI data chip at the very end of the episode foreshadows the possibility that Halsey is getting ready to use Cortana to step in and stop the Chief from doing something. 
which will likely be the beginning of Chief's full-blown rebellion against Halsey, possibly even the UNSC, and his own higher purpose, and his desire to become what he's meant to be. And there we have it, that's Points to Note Episode 4 of the Halo TV series. So far, I'm really enjoying it, and I'd really like to hear your comments in regards to the theory, the working theory, that the foreigner artifacts that Chief has interfaced with both as a child and most recently on Madrigal could have a direct connection to the domain in that when he touched them as a child it uploaded his childhood memories to the domain and he's simply accessing those memories again now after touching the keystone on Madrigal most recently and perhaps has unlocked something of his gene song to mean that he's actually able to connect with the domain at all times now. Again, any thoughts, pop them in the comments down below, and I look forward to you joining me on the next Points of Note. Thanks for watching, commenting, liking, and subscribing. I just want to give a quick shout out to my patrons and YouTube members, Spartan10148, my Metarch, Dylan, FalconX003, Kenwood, Irrefutable Justice, Leon, Neek, and Ramiz, my monitors, Alvin, Andrew, Brand, Brian, Cameron, Chris, Darian, Devon, Flaming Halo, Greenblood, Kyle, Legions Lost, Michael, Prophet Bear, Spartan and Wolf, my sub-monitors, my fleet of Strato Sentinels, my diligent enforcers, and all the other awesome people that have jumped aboard to support the channel over at Patreon. Another shout out to Todd Morrison, my transcendent YouTube member, and just one quick reminder to support us on all major social media channels including Discord. Much love from Zero Zero. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain. <laughs>